Hello, my name is Candy Cooper, and I am the author with Mark Aronson of Poisoned Water, How the Citizens of Flint, Michigan Fought for Their Lives and Warned the Nation. I am a longtime uh, journalist and investigator, and I'm also uh, from Michigan. I was born in Kalamazoo. I worked for the De Detroit Free Press for five years, and I was a Mike Wallace mid-career journalism fellow at the University of Michigan. So I was there for, for a year as well. And so when Mark suggested this idea, I was very eager to, to follow it. Hi, I'm Mark Aronson. I'm the co-author on Poisoned Water, and I've been a writer and editor of books for children and teenagers for over 30 years. And I teach in the library school at Rutgers, and I'm really grateful that you're giving us this chance to speak with you because, you know, as I tell all my students, uh, a library is not a warehouse for books. It's the center of a community, and the other place that has that same identity as a community center is the independent bookstore. And so to have a chance to tell you about our process and the book we've created uh, and why we think it may uh, be an important book for all of you is, is really a thrill for me. And I will talk a little more later. Hello, my name is Keyshawn Wade. Um, I was interviewed by Candy and I am also featured in the book. I'm really excited. To be a part of it. So one question uh, that often comes up um, is why did you write this as a book for younger readers? You know, Candy did such rich and intense research that in many ways there are new ideas here for adults. But our conviction is that young people live in a world where everything of great intensity, and this is even before the pandemic, is coming into their lives, whether that's through leaders like Greta or Malala, whether it's through YA novels like The Hate You Give. Uh, young people are feeling the impact of the world on them, and they are recognizing that both the world has great difficulties, that they're not in some kind of Disneyland bubble, but also that they have a role to play in changing and making a better world, in speaking out. And that's so much of what's in the world in our present. And it's so much of the story of Flint that Candy managed to uncover and that Keishan really helped us to understand. So that's why we really feel uh, this book uh, should be shaped for young people. And I should add also, there's a treat in nonfiction for young adults, and that is that it has great writing, but it also has illustration, it has images. And we selected the images to really give you the feeling, the visual feeling of the incre ever increasing intensity of the voice and community as it spoke out about the issues in Flint. And so we hope the package of the book really tells a full story. And I think that um, youth really are at the center of the story about the water crisis. Um, they're the ones who were most impacted by lead. Of course, lead harms uh, zero to six-year-olds the most, and those kids now are um, moving through the Flint schools, and the latest research research is showing that one in five are in need of special education. And, you know, kids in Flint know that the harm of lead can last, you know, the rest of your lives and into a next generation. So it's very real for them. Um, and I think the other thing to remember is that the relationship of Flint youth and children to water is so altered by uh, what happened in Flint. Um, they have had to brush their teeth with bottled water. They've found the water to burn their skin. They see the little particles floating in their glass of water. So it's a very visceral experience of an elemental human need. And I think um, it's a generation that will look at their tap water as as poison, really. 
Um, I thought I would talk a little bit about my reporting for the book. Um, there really were two aspects to it, and the first was rather um, easy or straightforward, and the second was was much more difficult. Um, I was among what I would call maybe a second wave of researchers and storytellers to come to Flynn in 2017, 2018. And by then, I really had the advantage of mountains of um, material in the public record. So there were government reports, academic papers, and a ton of news stories, of course, So and recorded video. So I had the advantage of all of that hindsight and assessment, and I think our book really has benefited by that. The more difficult side of that really was um, overcoming a tremendous level of mistrust and distrust actually in, in around the time that I got there, you know, this parade of outsiders who'd come in had created a kind of fatigue, outsider fatigue. And I think um, I was then dealing with a sense of betrayal and, and distrust and suspicion of most people who were coming into the community. Um, Catherine Boo talks about the idea of the earned fact that only through sustained, immersive, you know, ground level reporting can you truly, truly know something. And I feel like uh, by going to Flint time and again, spending a lot of time, um, that became an earned fact. And while there were certainly people who didn't want to speak to me, there were many more who did, some community leaders and a lot of youth. And I'm really indebted to people like uh, Keyshawn for, for that. Um, I thought I would talk a little bit about the takeaways of, uh, of the book. And I sort of feel like Flint is a story that moves from rage and outrage to hope in a way, although the story is very far from finished. Um, I feel like there's this overall lesson in democracy that um, Flint, in the run-up to the, to the water crisis, was being run by one person appointed by the governor whose only job was to cut costs. And that meant that the mayor and all of the elected council, all the elected officials in, in Flint were stripped of power. So um, the citizens of Flint really lost the power of their elected representatives. There were no checks and balances. And so they had to become the missing leaders. And they came together, crossed racial, uh, class and ethnic divides, and the community, the community itself became the engine that forced a return to clean water. So I think that's a lesson about empowerment, about citizenship, and really about um, reclaiming democracy. And uh, I'd like to, Keyshawn, maybe you can elaborate a little on that. I think a part of reclaiming our democracy is like how we look at um, democracy itself and how we look at our government and these institutions that um, are above us. I think, especially as youth, um, we are born into the status quo and we see the status quo as um, something that is inherent and something that is natural. And it's not, it's, um, the status quo is inherently untenable. Um, I think capitalism and neoliberalism and, you know, all these factors that went into making um, the Flint water prices is a lesson for us to see that this is how situations like these continue to happen and will continue to happen over time. And I think it's a call to action um, for us to change these institutions and to, for us to um, know that we can move past and we can um, look at alternatives and change the direction of our future and who we want to be as a country, as a world, and what we value. Beautifully said. Thank you. Thank you.